Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning and welcome to day three of Google I.O. Hope you've had an amazing time so far. We are delighted to have you with us this morning for our panel, Designing for the Other Half, Sexy Isn't Always Pink. My name is Mary Himmenkuhl, and I'm the head of Global Entrepreneurship Outreach at Google. Our team looks after all of Google's partnerships and programs around the world to support startups and entrepreneurs, and we feel very privileged to work with and learn from so many amazing entrepreneurs around the world. We have five of them with us here today. And tonight, today we're going to explore a discussion of really how to build amazing products that resonate with both women and men, how to scale and start great companies, how to build community, really an analysis of the business and product landscape and opportunities around women as well. So I'd like to start by introducing my fantastic panelists. First, we have Tracy Cho, who is with Pinterest. And Tracy is a back-end software engineer at Pinterest. She was previously at Quora, where she was an early engineer there. And she's also had roles at both Facebook and Google. Tracy studied at Stanford, where she earned her BS in electrical engineering and her master's in computer science. We also have Leah Busk, who is the founder of TaskRabbit. Since its founding in 2008, Leah has scaled TaskRabbit to over 45 employees, and the service is live in eight different cities. Prior to that, Leah was a software engineer at IBM, and she's been recognized as one of the 100 most creative people in business by Fast Company, and also one of the 15 women to watch by Inc. Magazine, so we're thrilled to have her with us. Next to me here is Margaret Wallace. Margaret is an active entrepreneur in the gaming, technology, and media sectors. She is the CEO of Playmatics, which is a New York-based company focused on rich social gaming experiences. And before Playmatics, Margaret was the CEO of Rebel Monkey. She's also spent time at Shockwave.com, at PF Magic, at Mattel, and Mindscape. And she recently created a very cool game last year, which is a shadow government game that lets users run their own version of a uh, virtual version of the US. We're also excited to have Jess Lee, who is the co-founder and CEO of Polyvore, which was voted one of Fast Company's 50 Most Innovative Companies in 2012. Before that, Jess worked at Google, where she was a product manager for Google Maps. And she has a bachelor's in computer science from Stanford. Jess is also a very talented artist, and she's an avid comic book collector. She has over 1,000 comic books. We're also delighted to have Seppi Nasiri with us. Seppi is the director of All Things Offline at Women 2.0. She's responsible for global partnerships and for sponsorships. And Seppi got her start as a managing editor of an LA global magazine. A fun tidbit about Seppi is that two years ago, she launched her first um, app in the Apple Store. And it is a date saver platinum application, which gives users a portable bathroom fan. So we have to ask her about that later. But welcome, all of you. We're delighted to have you. And welcome to everybody here. Thank you so much for joining us. So I'd like to start by turning it over to our great panelists this morning and ask each of you to share with us a one-minute introduction of your company and its core mission. Starting with you, Margaret. Hi, good, mor good morning, everybody. It's really great to see everyone in the room. My name is Margaret Wallace. I am the CEO of a company called Playmatics. Uh, I co-founded Playmatics with Nick Fortuno. He's a game designer, probably best known for having designed uh, Diner Dash, which I think a few of us in this room may have played. I've been in gaming, at the intersection of gaming, tech, and media since, it's kind of not cool to say it, since 1996. And I've worked on all sides of the equation, on publisher sides, of technology companies, I've raised venture capital, and Playmatics is a 15-person company in, based in New York City. Uh, about a year and a half ago, we raised some angel investment and to create a, a game called Shadow Government, which is a real-world political simulation in the United States that runs off of a 30-year-old al algorithmic model called the T21. But we really focus on um, designing engaging, hopefully engaging social games for both women and men, and we try not to clone. So that's sort of a quick intro of who I am. Nice to meet everybody here, too. Hi, I'm Tracy Chow. Um, I'm with Pinterest. Um, if you haven't used Pinterest before, um, it's a place online where you can collect and find the images and, and things that, you, that really inspire you and that you love. Um, and we're really hoping to be a place for discovery on the web and working on building that out. 
My background is in engineering, and I really love working and building consumer web products. Um, so I love thinking about the technical aspects, but also translating product, um, product ideas into the back ends. Good morning, my name is Sepina Siri, and I'm, as mentioned, director of all things offline at Women 2.0. Women 2.0's mission is to increase the number of female founders in technology startups. And to do so, um, we have our online component, which is our blog network. And we also have our offline products, um, including our conference and our events. Hi, everyone. My name is Leah Buskey. I'm the CEO of TaskRabbit. TaskRabbit is an online marketplace where people can go to outsource small jobs and tasks to others in their neighborhood. So if you need dry cleaning picked up or groceries delivered, you can go on TaskRabbit.com or download our mobile app, name the price you're willing to pay to have a job done, and then we match you with our network of hundreds of background check TaskRabbits in your neighborhood. Our mission is really to empower people to do what they love. Um, I'm Jess Lee, the co-founder and CEO of Polyvore. Polyvore is a fashion community site with over 15 million unique visitors a month. Um, I guess Mary just outed me as a comic book nerd and someone who loves to draw. Um, I, I really wanted to go to art school uh, when I was growing up, and my parents told me no because they're Asian. Um, so <laughs> I ended up studying computer science, and um, I was really excited to, to come across Polyvore because Polyvore is a place where people can just mix and match items they love in a very artistic way to create these collages. So we essentially have a platform and tools that empower other people to be artistic and creative. So it's something that I'm really passionate about. And I think it's, uh, it's sort of akin to a fashion magazine, except it's created by a global community of fashionistas uh, from all over the world. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. So I'd like to start by looking a bit at the product landscape. And so starting with Tracy. With Pinterest, tell us about the evolution of Pinterest and how you, how your users are interacting with the site. Sure, um, I can give a little bit of history. So Pinterest has actually been around for a few years now. Um, it was founded, started getting kicked off in 2009. Most people didn't hear about it until late 2011. So it's actually quite a long time of trying to uh, iterate on the product and and get traction with users. Um, it is a it's meant to be a general platform for um, collecting and sharing images. And it's resonated a lot with um, people who work in industries that are very inspiration driven. So a lot of architects were on early. Like one of our founders who is a designer was in architecture school. Um, and so he found a lot of similarities between Pinterest and the physical boards in which he'd be collecting inspiration. Um, there's a lot of people who are doing arts and crafts on Pinterest, um, and just like getting ideas and thinking about things that they want to do. Um, as we've evolved, it's just been this gradual process of acquiring a community um, and thinking about reaching out to people, figuring out what makes the most sense for them, um, and responding to feedback a lot. Um, I guess, I'm not sure like what, what else there is to say, it's just, um, Keep talking to your community, seeing what they want, um, but there's not too much that's like too mind blowing. Um, as we've evolved, we've just been acquiring more and more people who are interested in, um, you know, looking at different recipes that people are pinning, um, finding inspiration for their homes. So there's a pretty wide ranging appeal um, for just like, you know, there, it started off with a lot of women in in the Midwest, but starting to to find greater appeal. Um, and Tracy, you're on the engineering side, so when you, when you guys built the product, did you design it specifically with women in mind? No, it was meant to be a general platform. Um, yeah, so the founding team was actually three men, and um, the team has been majority men for a long time. And they really want to, like, we really want to build a general platform, but as any sort of site like um, that, that focuses on community, we'll see who you seed the community with will determine a lot of the early demographic. Um, actually, previously, I was at Quora, which is also meant to be a general platform for question and answers. But it also started off being primarily male. Um, and it just is a function of who you see the community with. And um, you can start growing beyond that initial seed as you figure out your product. Thank you. Thank you. So speaking of growth and scale, Leah, I have a question for you. So TaskRabbit has scaled rapidly into eight cities. And can you share with us what the trigger points are for you to know when to invest 
more resources than double down in a specific city, market, or on a product feature? What's the inflection point for you? Yeah, it's interesting. When I, when I think back, about a year ago, we were just in a couple of markets. And at that time, uh, Boston and San Francisco were our two main markets. We started to dig into our database and our data and really did a deep dive on who our top users were at the time, who were the top people posting tasks. And so in a two-sided marketplace, we have the task rabbits and we have the task posters. And so once we did the analysis of who our top task posters were uh, in Boston and San Francisco, we started to see some uh, trends and some commonality. And that was the point where we learned that you know, our two top demographics both skewed slightly female. Um, the first demo was 25 to 35 year old young professional living in an urban environment. She was outsourcing things like, I need help with my grocery shopping, handyman services, laundry. Um, and then the next demographic up, it was a jump, and it was the 35 to 45 year old female, typically a mom uh, with kids working full time. And it wasn't um, just moms, they, because we saw on the TaskRabbit side a lot of stay-at-home moms that were doing TaskRabbit um, to bring in income and bring in money, uh, and they were out running their own errands anyway and didn't mind picking things up for people. So once we had enough data to really deep dive into our main core demographics, that's when we started to make um, explicit decisions about design about product features, about, about implementation, um, that we felt would cultivate the best user experience around uh, those demographics. Wonderful, wonderful. Margaret, so gaming is a topic that we know resonates well with both men and women. You have such deep expertise in the area. I'm hoping you can share with us more context and some data points on the landscape of gaming, and are there any patterns or trends that have surprised you? Uh, yeah, so um, that's a great question. And, you know, Playmatics, we, we create a range of uh, IP, whether you're talking about original IP, we work with brands, and we also work a lot in the uh, growing and contentious field of gamification, and, uh, which is sort of adding game-like dynamics uh, to non-gaming uh, consumer services. And uh, I, I would say, in gaming in particular, the biggest change that I've, ex I've seen over, since, uh, gosh, the 90s, when I was working on the first ever virtual pets programs, dogs and cats, is, is you know, um, you know, the female audiences have become a very core demographic for, as you probably all know in this audience, casual games and social games. And I don't know how many people here are in the gaming world, uh, but we have a, f a phrase called whales. I don't know if it's used in other industry sectors, but you know, in the past five years, free-to-play games have really become uh, really the, the, the cash cow, so to speak, of social and um, casual games. So these are games that are free to download, free to play, uh, but to progress and accelerate your experience or have a more customizable experience, one buys virtual currency and, 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 and purchase, purchases accelerators or virtual goods to progress through the game. And you know, even as recently, you know, there have been tons of studies which show that uh, one to two percent, if you're lucky, will become purchasing players in these games. And there's a study, there are many studies, but I found one which was released by Papaya Mobile back in uh, September of 2011, which identified uh, for their network that 70% of the whales, and whales are people who spend $100 or more in your game, are female. And I can tell you, uh, while uh, there's a renewed interest in casual social gaming around mid-core gaming, so targeting sort of more traditional gaming audiences, um, that's probably the audience that my game Shadow Government appeals to, we all know from all the successes of, of social gaming companies, especially in the Bay Area, that 70 to 80% of their players are females and uh, often comprise the majority of whales. So on the one hand, it's something to be celebrated and, and pointed out that you know, w women represent a huge amount of purchasing power within social and casual gaming. And yet a lot of the social games that we see on the market have often been criticized as being a bit exploitative, uh, playing on people's addictions. And you know, it's just an interesting question, what does it mean that, the, that kind of the largest audience for these um, games are women? So on the one hand, it's, it's a success story, it's something to call attention to. 
Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it, it kind of um, causes me to question sort of, you know, how we monetize our audience and what are kind of, I know ethics can be a bad word in the world of entrepreneurship sometimes, but you know, what are the ethics around monetizing that audience? Very interesting. So then general question for anybody, what, um, what patterns have you, have you seen in how your user base monetizes? Any interesting trends or things of note? I think the most important part is um, what is your user base asking for? So um, for Women 2.0, it's mostly either educational um, components. So we launched last year a video about how to build your own iPhone app. And within two weeks, we had over 9,000 do downloads. So it shows that if you listen to your audience or your user base, you're able to monetize. Thank you, Sapi. And on that note, you know, Women 2.0, your organization does specifically outreach to women. So what have you found to be sticky and what are the, the topics and themes that resonate most among your user base? Um, well, sticky qu questions would be career-based. Um, uh, women in tech or women just general, they're still um, finding ways to grow um, and um, where they would like to take their career, particularly because uh, women have different responsibilities than men. Um, and showing that as a mom, um, you can still have a company and grow your company and educating them of how to have a life and work balance is important. So those would be the first question we get every day. And besides that, when you have decided to um, build your own company, then how do I get funding? Um, and most importantly, what Women 2.0 provides is the platform for networking. Um, for example, our networking events where you can build your network, who is also going to be the ones who are partnering with you and funding you, et cetera. Great, great. So on that point about community, Jess, Polivore is very much about community. You guys have over 15 million monthly unique visitors. Can you share with us your thoughts on how to build community among your users, both women and men? And how do you solicit feedback from your community? Uh, sure. So Polyvore is very much rooted in the community. We're, we're nothing without our awesomely talented uh, user base. They're the people who grab products from all over the web and import them into Polyvore. They're the people who put together the beautiful collages and sets, some of which are, in terms of you know, aesthetic quality and taste, are like up there with the top editors of Vogue. So I'm very, very proud of the community that we've built. Um, it's been about the community from the very beginning, partly because, um, so I think a good example is I actually came out of our user community. So I was working at Google Maps and I was very happy there. And then one day my office, my cube mate showed me, um, hey, check out this site, Polyvore, that my friend is working on. And I played with it and I was just blown away. It was sort of like the perfect mix of art and technology and I was just using it two to three hours a night. Um, and then I, I wrote to uh, the founder at the time and I said, hey, can I, can I, yeah, this is great. Let me have some feedback from you. A lot of complaints, actually. So I wrote him a long list of complaints. And then he wrote back and said, hey, why don't you come fix this yourself? Uh, so then I ended up coming on board at, at Polyvore. And so I was already part of the user community. So I already had friends in the community. And this is before Facebook Connect existed. So this was like people who did not actually know each other in real life. Um, but we became friends. And so ever since then, I've always stayed in touch with all those community members. And we, we take it very seriously. Um, our philosophy around the community is, is to always go the extra mile. So when people write in, you know, we take the time to actually write back. Um, for our very, very top members, and some of these people have been using this site for like five years. They're so loyal. They post their sets to Facebook. They post their sets to Twitter. They're the people who have actually helped us grow because they tell their friends about the site. Um, so I think a good example of how we listen to our community um, we recently had a meetup. We try to actually bring our members in every once in a while. So on Friday, we had a meetup with about 11 members. Um, we flew some in from, there was one girl from Brazil, uh, Wisconsin, Hawaii. Um, you know, it, th these people have dedicated like years of their life. Like one girl had been using this site since, since she was 13 years old and now she's 18. Um, so she kind of grew up on Polyvore. So, you know, we brought them all in and we just really tried to show them how much we appreciate them and how much we love them. So um, we pampered them. We had like a We'll make up station for them to get uh, makeovers sponsored by uh, Bear Essentials. And then we, uh, we did a couple of uh, sessions with them. One, we had our designers walk through how we roll out changes on the site. Because as I'm sure um, a lot of people know, when you change something on a site that people are used to, they get, they get really mad. It's called change aversion, right? It doesn't matter if it's a good change or a bad change. Oftentimes, the initial reaction is, I hate it. It's different. Um, so we walk them through you know, how we 
how we look at that process. And part of it is we actually count all the comments on the blogs um, from our users. And sometimes we change something, we get 500 comments. So we count all of them, and then we measure how many were positive and negative. And I think what's special about our community is sometimes there's a lot of negative comments, and then someone's like, hey, leave them alone. They're working really hard. They answered my email immediately. So it's good to have a community, because they, they in turn defend you when something goes wrong. And we, we've made mistakes, and we rolled them back. People are generally very understanding. But we flew out these members. Um, we showed them a good time. We previewed a couple of new features with them, got a lot of feedback. And it was really special. It was a special day for them, I think, to meet each other as well. There are a couple of cool stories that came out of the community. I found out that one of our members is, uh, she met a girl on the site who she's now inviting to her wedding that she'd never met before, <laughs> um, which I thought was pretty, I would never invite someone I'd never met to my wedding. <laughs> um, and then it turned out that three of the members had actually been, and we didn't know this beforehand, but they had been inspired to actually go to fashion school and graphic design school because of all their time spent on Polly, where they really realized how good they were at um, graphic design, and so now they're pursuing careers. So that's really, that's really meaningful. Um, it's really meaningful for us, for the team, and then it's, it's a good opportunity for us to really show them how much we appreciate them, and then in turn to get feedback from them. Um, Extension of that question to any of the panelists. So any key lessons learned or insights on how to engage user feedback and incorporate it into your product? I can start. So um, I think the key is just make it really, really easy for your users to give you feedback. So at TaskRabbit, we have 24-7 customer service. We have chat. We have phones. You know, we're on email all the time. Um, in the product flow, we also have little hooks where people can easily leave their comments and feedback. And I think the key is when we see something that hasn't gone quite right or that we could improve, we'll follow up with the user with a phone call or an email, we really try to understand how we can make sure that every time someone has an experience on TaskRabbit, it's amazing. And if it's not of the highest quality, then we're immediately digging in to figure out why and what we can improve. And then the second thing I would say, um, kind of along, along the lines of what I just mentioned with product, is uh, we have weekly uh, user testing sessions or user research sessions. And basically, every week, Thursdays, we have a group of users come in. Um, we don't know what we're going to show them every week. Sometimes the marketing team will run by some messaging or new ad campaigns with them. Sometimes the designers will show them what they're working on um, going forward from a user experience standpoint. Sometimes we just have you know, questions about uh, you know, pricing or what they want to see more of. And so I think having a consistent pattern of a way to get in front of your users all of the time is really, really important. Um, and just to jump in really quickly on the gaming front, um, you know, designers, game designers always engage in this debate, how much should one be led by the community? How much does, can the community anticipate design? So in gaming, it's always a fine line between listening to the community and responding, but also taking those leaps of faith or, or incorporating that magic sauce that goes into making hopefully great games. However, I think any of us who've been in gaming the past few years, especially in the social gaming sector, know how much analytics have really risen to the forefront, almost to a reductive fashion where game designers will come up with an engagement loop for a game or some kind of uh, monetization loop. And before that even gets uh, implemented, that gets run through a whole series of analytics, um, real-time analytics. Um, we use a package called Swerve, which is really wonderful. But the larger the social game company, the less and less things are left up to chance because it really becomes about spreadsheets. So it has its benefits, but I think it also has its drawbacks uh, on the creative front. Um, I, I do think you also have to figure out the right kinds of questions to ask your, your community. What we found is when you ask, like, hey, what do you think of this idea of this feature? They'll say, yeah, that sounds really great. <laughs> um, so that, that's not as useful as saying, here, look at this actual prototype of this. Tell us what you think. Can you complete this given task? So you really have to, um, you, and you also have to listen not just to what your users say, but what they do. So rolling out an A-B experiment where they, you, you, you try the new feature, you can either so the, the process that we use is oftentimes we, um, we test with a, a top group of uh, VIP members, sort of, and then we get their feedback, their qualitative feedback, and then we move to like a 5% or 10% experiment, and you have to figure out what sample size actually makes sense for you. Um, and then we, we actually measure some of the metrics we care about, and then we roll it out to the whole community. And then we know that if it's a big change, they may complain, so then we have in reserve some other things that we may roll out soon afterwards that will sort of 
um, mitigate the, <laughs> the negativity, and then we're very quick to respond. Like as soon as the launch happens, we, you know, everyone is watching the blog post and like monitoring for comments, because so, there's definitely things we don't think of, and then we try to implement those things as fast as possible. And what we find is that our community actually notices. They say, hey, I noticed that that changed immediately after I reported it. Um, I saw that you added that commenting feature I asked for a day afterwards. That's so cool. Thank you. Um, so I think it's, it's good to be really, really responsive right after your launch, too. It's not done when it's launched. Really good insight, definitely. I have one thing to add, which is um, on the company side, it's also very important to dedicate resources to community in terms of employees, like the headcount. Um, at Pinterest, we have I think six or seven community team people um, out of a total of 50 right now. And um, they are very empowered to, I mean, they have a lot of responsibility and we have them sit with um, product and engineering when we're making design decisions. So it's not just responding to um, new product features when we're about to roll them out. We have community teams sitting with us and saying, you know, I'm getting a lot of reports from users that they really like this or they really don't like this, so we should incorporate it into the new designs that we're rolling out. Um, so just making community a priority within the company is very important. And then the other thing is having a good system to track um, what the community is saying. So we track different types of tickets um, in Zendesk, and we have graphs of like how many tickets we're getting for different different types of issues, and it just helps us to know what people care about in a very qual um, quantitative but also qualitative way. So on that point of building a great team within the company and, and scaling a great company, how do you guys approach hiring and building a team, and what is your interview process like? Uh, so at TaskRabbit, uh, we, we've kind of honed in on a process over, over the course of about 12 months or so. And so um, whoever we're interviewing, whatever candidate comes in, typically they initially um, do a phone call with uh, Ryan, who's our talent scout. And then they come in and they meet the hiring manager, but then they also meet a few other key team members on the team. Uh, and if that goes well, they'll come in for a second round of interviews with a wider group. And this round of interviews is really important because we pick people across teams and across functions. And so we're not only looking for um, folks that have the right skill sets um, and can actually do the job really well, but also folks that are gonna work well and are a great culture fit across the entire company. Um, and then from there, something that I've always been uh, very adamant and passionate about is uh, I don't care how big we get, I want to meet, uh, you know, every single person that comes through the door. And um, we'll see how long it, that scales to, I'm not sure. Um, but we have this sort of founder round interviews, and it's not really um, set up so that I, you know, have the power to say yay or nay on someone. That's not what it is at all. It's actually really important to me um, for those candidates to know that I want to know who they are and that I am a resource to them and that I want to be engaged with them as well. And it doesn't matter what team they're on or what they're working on. Um, it's important to me to have that sort of open door policy. And that starts as part of the candidate interview process. Um, so that's worked really well for us. And But we're continuing to sort of change and iterate it over time. So we have similar actually, um, uh, ways of interviewing uh, when we add someone to our team. Uh, one of the main, I guess, focus for us is personality. Um, we, our team currently is three main people, which includes our CEO and co-founder, Shao Rose, Tarania, and Angie Chang, uh, and then myself. Um, and what we do is we always have this philosophy, can you share a pillow with this person if you have to? We, <laughs> we do work late, so, um, and we consider everyone who we add to our team as a family. Um, you eat with them, you sometimes have to share that pillow <laughs> in the office, so making sure that we all have the same chemistry and we are all focused on the same goals um, is important. And we do have teams across the country, internationally as well, and so we do chat with them and make sure that they feel with us that they're included so yeah. some of the people that play Maddox are folks that uh, I've worked with in previous companies are one guy who was the original designer uh, uh, programmer on the first Diner Dash game um, I've known and worked with him for 12 years and so I'm really fortunate to have people that 
good people that you keep with you along the way, um, but we're a small, scrappy startup. And so we, we rely largely on not only referrals, uh, and if you're lucky enough to know a lot of people, it's pretty easy to pull in resources as you need them. My co-founder teaches at a, a local university in the game design program, so in terms of fresh talent, we're always meeting and recruiting fresh talent. We have something called the camping test, kind of like the pillow test. Can I go camping with this person? Because really at the end of the day, and I've made this mistake before, I've, I've, I've made fewer and fewer mistakes in hiring than, than when I first started out where I made a bunch. Uh, one, one kind of thing I've learned is, is culture and cultural fit. It doesn't matter if this person is a superstar, if they are the Einstein of whatever area they're focusing on, if they cannot work with other people. When you're a 15-person company, it's just not going to work, and it's going to really sour the morale of the rest of the office. So I've learned, and my co-founder have learned, we've been really lucky just bringing in good people, bringing in right people, and then if there is a problem, just really addressing it immediately. Because when one runs a startup, as you can imagine, it's the little, little mistakes that you don't think of that six months or three months down the line that you just think, oh, why didn't I act sooner? So that's kind of our process. Uh, everybody gets to meet just about everyone else, but my co-founder and I are the final decision makers. We're a small company. We have to be stealth and scrappy, so it, it kind of works out like that. We do have pretty good diversity on the team, uh, which I'm pretty proud of, uh, and it's really largely because the applicants that come to us are from, a diverse, uh, from diverse backgrounds. So everybody remember the camping test and the pillow test. Um, so I'd love to talk about the process of fundraising, as funding is obviously a very important component of scaling a business. Any insights from you guys on the process, how you approached it, what your considerations were? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't mean to... Just really quickly, it takes always takes longer than you think it does. If the money is too easy to come by, that should be a red flag. If the money is too hard to come by, you keep getting the same answers, that should be a, potentially a red flag. It's, it's a diligent process. It's a process of constantly refining and improvement, improving. Like I said, I've successfully raised venture capital. I've unsuccessfully raised it, and I've successfully raised angel investment. And every single meeting that you have, one has, with potential investors is a, is a chance to learn. So the biggest uh, point of advice I would give to anyone in the audience is when you have these meetings, even meetings that are, quote, throwaway meetings with C-level people that you may not be interested in, you know, C-tier people you may not be interested in working with, write everything down, you'll find that the same questions often bubble up and those are things you need to address in order to probably successfully fundraise in the future. Um, so at Polyvore we've raised three rounds, although the total sum is, is not that high. In, and so A, B, and C are actually very different. <laughs> um, so for the A, we raised about uh, two and a half million dollars from Benchmark Capital in 2007. And I think in the beginning, when you know it's it could be seed, it could be a uh, the easiest way to raise is to have traction. <laughs> That's kind of obvious and, and also very difficult. But that was the the approach that that we took at the time. We already built the site was already built and sort of on its a little bit on its way. So it became an easier sort of sell. Um, the Series B was in 2009 in the summer, and this was when the economy was like Ugh. so a much more difficult time to raise, even though we were doing well. Um, it was just it was just much harder. So we were hitting like Sand Hill Road and talking to all the VCs. And um, I think through that process, we learned we honed sort of what our deck should look like. Like what are the key things you really need to cover, which are product, market, and team. And of the three, it actually turns out I think that market is really really important. Um, if your product is not solving a large enough market, then you won't get certain kinds of, of, of VCs to invest. So we we successfully raised our B from Matrix Capital about 5.6 million in 2009, and then our C, which we just closed in January. This was before for the Facebook IPO, which I've heard has affected valuations. But um, that one was, uh, I guess, again, different market conditions. So this was after a lot of companies had raised like a lot of money in 2011, and the market was, the climate was very good. Um, so that was a much easier round to raise. And then at that point, we had, we had more traction. So we closed a $14 million round in, in January. Um, all very different. Um, so our C, we raised from DAG, uh, more sort of a standard Silicon Valley type VC, great, great firm, and then Goldman Sachs, which is very, not traditionally, I think we were like the eighth company they, they had ever invested in, so very different sort of due diligence process. Due diligence is obviously much more strict in the, in the C stage or the later stage, but uh, Goldman Sachs was especially <laughs> strict um, because I, I think they're, they're sort of, um, they're, pub, they're, they're big public companies, so they, you know, they have a lot of um, 
uh, process they have to go through to get the money approved. Great, great. So we have a lot of entrepreneurs here in the audience with us today. What advice do you ladies have for startups or companies who are looking on, on how to design with women in mind? And how, sort of how targeted is your marketing? Um, I would say uh, just general advice is uh, find great mentors, advisors, people that you can surround yourself with, that you can use as a sounding board, bounce around ideas. Um, if you feel like going into uh, your idea or company, you know exactly who the demographic is, then find an advisor or mentor that you feel like matches that. So you can kind of use them um, uh, to do a lot of uh, research early on. But then I would say don't assume you know um, who you're building for until you actually build it um, and get those users and start looking through the data. And that's going to tell you um, and influence your decisions about how to move forward. So I think it's more about constantly just iterating on customer feedback in your community rather than assuming you know know uh, exactly who you're designing for to begin with. Um, a couple points. One is if you can try to build up your intuition as much as possible early on, like Leo was saying, if you can get mentors or get people to come in so you understand generally what direction you want your product to go in, that's most important as you're getting started and you don't have any data to work with. And users aren't going to tell you what they want. Um, and one way also to, one hack to get better intuition about the products that you're trying to build is getting people from those demographics into your company and working there. Um, if you can hire female engineers, that helps. If you can hire female product managers, people who are actually using the product, um, they're gonna be there and that uh, feedback loop is just so much faster than having to go out and do user research or run some A-B tests and wait for two weeks to get the data. Um, if you just have someone who's there and can say, like, I am part of the demographic and this is what I like and this is what I, I think a lot of other people will like, um, it's just much easier to build those products. Thank you. In just a couple of minutes, we'll start taking audience questions. So if anybody has questions in mind, please go ahead and line up and we'll take them in just a few minutes. So question then about a lot of your products has, have spread very virally. And in addition to this organic growth, how do you approach proactive marketing to the extent that you do? So uh, for us, 75% uh, of our users come in via word of mouth and PR, just general awareness. So that's awesome because it's free channels um, and it is very organic and viral. But when we think about uh, money that we do spend on marketing, whether it's um, SEM or display or retargeting, we try to get very um, targeted about the demographic. And uh, so we'll do partnerships, for instance, with moms groups um, or with community school organizations, PTAs. So we know that those are our top heavy users. And so finding the right outlets um, of where those users are is really important if you're going to spend. One thing for Pinterest is um, even though we haven't done a lot of marketing per se, we're pretty strategic about what press will do. Um, so if you're located in Silicon Valley and you're a startup here, it's very easy to get a lot of coverage by the tech blogs. Um, if that's not where your users are, there's not really much point in going to the tech blogs um, unless you're trying to do recruiting. But for us, we tend to do press or um, let people write about us if it's in some publication where we will be the only tech piece. And we try to be where our users are going to be. So if we're trying to get more people um, in home decor, then going to the, the magazines about interior decoration makes sense. Or going to um, like the mommy bloggers, like those all make sense. But not as much tech crunch. Um, we've actually, so we, we don't actually have a, a marketing team, but we do do marketing through uh, word of mouth through our community. And there's a standard, you know, build a great product and then they'll talk about it. There's always that. But on top of that, we actually try to cultivate great opportunities for our community members. So the fashion industry is a very top-down kind of industry, and Polyvore has a very bottoms-up approach. We're empowering all these fashionistas in, in all over the world to, to sort of have a voice in fashion. And so we've tried to create opportunities with our advertisers. So they're actually, they often end up being revenue-generating opportunities for us as well, which is kind of nice. Um, so, 
but some examples are um, we partnered with Rebecca Minkoff, who's a handbag designer, an independent accessories designer, um, and we wanted to we she wanted to promote her morning after clutch, which is a bag, her, her most famous sort of bag that she makes, and so she. We put together a campaign on Polyvore where we asked our members to design uh, their own version of her bag and they could put studs on it and you know, sort of pimp it out. Uh, and we got over, I think, 6,000 submissions from our uh, community. And then the, uh, the winner, who turned out to be this girl named Dee in uh, Detroit, she got to travel to New York for Fashion Week and sit in uh, Rebecca Minkoff's show and watch her creation. Her bag actually got produced and it went down the runway. Um, she got to see then. She had never been to New York before. She'd never been to Fashion Week, and so for her, that was, that was like a, you know, that was a major opportunity. And the bag got produced and sold in sacks. So doing those kinds of things, like she's going to remember that for a long time. Our community remembered it. Everyone was so excited. They were so supportive of her. The bag was named, you know, after her. It was called the D Clutch, and it actually sold out. So the things like that, I think, when you can cultivate things around your members and have them talk about you, that's much better than talking about yourself. Absolutely. So, first audience question. Yeah, so um, has it been a problem for something like uh, TaskRabbit at all, or how big of a problem for non-standard uses, like someone putting a task up to maybe have a, uh, a lot of people do reviews of a site or a game or uh, to get you know, promotion and, and sort of Mechanical Turk kind of, kind of artificial promotion? Is that any kind of outside uses like that? Is that a big problem? Also, audience members, we'd love for you to introduce yourselves as Oh, well. sorry, Jason okay. Sackett. Okay. Hi, Jason. Thanks for your question. Um, so it hasn't it hasn't been a huge problem. Um, we've seen it on a couple occasions. I think for us, the key is we ask our task posters to put in credit card information up front. And we use that um, to verify identity and keep our task rabbit safe. And we pre-authorize cards. So that rules out a lot of sort of the spam. Um, but then on top of that, we also have what we call a self-policing community. So anyone in the community can flag a, a task as inappropriate, and then it's immediately uh, looked at by our internal operations team and taken down if it's deemed inappropriate. Um, so we haven't really come across a lot of those types of issues yet. Maybe, maybe they're coming, I don't know, but that's how we've handled it to date. Yeah, I was thinking more about the uh, ethical considerations of, you know, the, of, of media and games and, and these uh, sort of addictive loops and stuff. And this, this particular task, is not necessarily not necessarily inappropriate. It depends on what's inappropriate. Uh, so I'm, you know, there's a lot of room there, a lot of gray area. Yes, and that is that is the unspoken secret. A lot of the social mobile games kind of work their numbers that way by finding like uh, people to write reviews and not necessarily using TaskRabbit, but it's a big concern. Thank you. Hi, I'm Pablo Perez. Uh, I have a question for Tracy of Pinterest, but I'd also like to hear everybody else's opinion too. Uh, Pinterest, it sounds like it, it took a couple of years for you to kind of for it to really take off. And at, at what point? At what point was that tipping point where you just saw it really accelerate? And uh, did social networks play into it, or was it the users? Or it's a really great question. Um, thank you. We've asked ourselves this very same question, and we don't know the answer. <laughs> so, I mean, if you're just looking at the numbers um, and, and the shape of the graph, it was sometime, it's like last spring or summer where it started to pick up a little bit more, and um, there were huge growth spikes um, the end of last year and beginning of this year. Um, we don't actually really know what they were. Like, from the beginning, Facebook and Twitter were already around, so those distribution channels already existed. Um, and there was no particular event that precipitated like an, an inflection point. Um, I think it's just keeping at it, and eventually, if you have the right growth rate, um, it will start picking up. Yeah, I would add, I think for TaskRabbit and a lot of other companies, it's so much about timing. Sometimes the consumer mindset just needs time to develop. And, you know, I started TaskRabbit back in the end of 2008. Uh, it was September of 2008, and actually when I launched it, right when the stock market was crashing and all these people were getting laid off, and I had just quit my job at IBM, which I was starting to rethink at the time. And uh, what was interesting is that ended up being a really great time 
to launch a platform like TaskRabbit because it gave people a way to make money, to make ends meet, to get by. Um, and then it grew from there. So I think so much of it is just the market needs to develop and how the market changes and then the consumer mindset tends to shift as well. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Tommy. Um, so I have a question about Google+. Um, I, so I hear Google+, Plus has a heavy skew towards male audience. I was curious, do you have any insights into, you know, like, um, what, what about their product makes it heavily skewed towards male as well as female, and how could they improve? You know, we use, uh, we use Google Hangouts for our board meetings, and so we use Google uh, Plus pretty heavily. And I really, uh, I think that um, personally, you know, my opinion as a user is it probably just needs an, a, a UI overhaul and um, kind of more, but, but, but uh, it's really, I guess, maybe the original audience that also kind of a, a appealed to and, and, and revolved around. But we use it all the time. I love it. I think Hangouts is revolutionary. Probably a UI thing. It's a UI thing. <laughs> I guess an extension of that question, though, for each of your products, do you notice how important is, is UI design when catering to a specific uh, sector of an audience? Um, I, so I like that the, the panel title is like, it's not always pink. Um, so if you look at Polyvore, which is definitely targeted at women, that we don't support menswear on the site at all, um, our UI is actually very spare and white and black. If you took out all the sets and you looked at just the elements we provide, you might even say that it's kind of masculine. We use Gotham font. It's just very spare. And the reason for that is we want to put our brand and our UI in the background and put the community in the foreground because they already make really gorgeous layouts and, and sets that express who they are. So we, we don't want to compete with that. You know, we don't want to put like a pink or a blue or anything else that might distract from what they're already doing. So I don't think it's actually necessary to have a particularly feminine visual design um, in order to attract women. Um, and to, to, uh, about Google+, Plus, I have one theory. It's just a theory. But I think the, the seed of any community is very, very important. Um, Polyvore was seeded with women on fashion forums. Um, I think Google Plus was actually seeded with Google employees. So it was tech and honestly, mostly male. Um, so I think that's part of how it grew. So those people invited their friends, which, and then that, I think that's sort of the root. Whereas you look at Facebook started at colleges. So like cool kids at college, or uh, maybe not cool, Ivy League <laughs> <laughs> kids at colleges. Um, yeah, and then MySpace, I think probably started with like music. And so it's, it's all about the seed. And I think the seed for Google Plus was just different. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Hey, my name is AJ. I'm from Montreal. Um, so I, I'm actually really sad to hear that Polyvore is only, um, it only has female clothing on. I was going to try it out. And I, um, I, I'm actually, yeah, maybe that's some constructive criticism for you. Uh, <laughs> so uh, my question is actually, uh, so women are clearly like a, a minority in the tech industry in that there's fewer of them. Um, how do you feel about the representation of women in the tech industry? We've been talking a lot about like you know your very inspirational stories, and that's really inspiring for me. But I I want to know about your thoughts on the way that women are represented, and also are you targeting other minorities in your in your design processes? Um, through yeah, conclusion. <laughs> I would love to add menswear one day, just by the way, to volleyball, <laughs> but. Um, our philosophy has always been do a few things well, like very, very narrow focus on a few things that we really want to nail women's fashion first, but I would love to expand to other categories at some point. Um, so women in, in, in tech in general. So uh, I remember when I, the year, I think it was the year after I graduated from Stanford, um, the computer science department had a t-shirt that said Stanford computer science, and it was, I think it was an unofficial t-shirt, but it was like nine guys and one girl, like stick figure. <laughs> and that was really true. I remember looking around in my CS class and I could like name all the other girls because there are just so few of them. Um, so I, I, I realized that, and, and then I graduated and then I, I went to Google and I had, I was very, very lucky that Google is a very treats is a very very equitable place. It's it's all about meritocracy. And I think that's actually the, one of the great things about tech in general. It is more meritocratic maybe than other industries. Um, but I was very lucky to have like key female mentors. Um, my first boss at, at Google was Marissa Mayer, who's amazing, and um, I was just very lucky. So, also my mom was a, is an entrepreneur. Um, she ran sort of her own sort of uh, 
she's an interpreter, Japanese English interpreter, um, and she ran sort of her home office. So I had a lot of female role models, so I figured that the best thing that I could do to give back is probably just help mentor. And it's actually not even just specific to women. Um, I, I, don't, t I, don't actually, I don't usually speak on a lot of panels about designing for women or women in tech, but what I found is the most useful thing is actually just when entrepreneurs like, are starting out and have questions, just taking the time to meet, like, you know, say yes to every coffee <laughs> and just you know, a little bit of advice. Because I remember all the people who really helped me very early on at Polyvore. There were people, the friend feed team let us like, squat in their office for like a year without paying any rent. So we tried to do the same. We paid it forward. We had another company squat with us for six months. So just giving back little, little bits of yourself, I think, makes all the difference in the world, both for women and, and men. I think also bringing awareness, such as today, we have a panel of women here and talking about who they are, what they have achieved. You don't see that quite often. And when you don't have um, those role models for you to watch out, okay, I can be the next generation of entrepreneur, I can build my successful company, et cetera, et cetera, then um, we don't grow up to have that passion to be the next entrepreneur or successful individual. Um, for me, the same, my dad is an entrepreneur, so I had that privilege to see um, what I could be someday, um, whether studying technology or being an engineer or just a founder and just creating something um, and having no, um, I guess, no limits to who I can be. Um, and so Google, as mentioned, has been trying to do that and is successful. Thank you. Well, I think we just have a few minutes left, so what I love is if the next two audience members could both ask their questions and then we can answer them as a group. Sure, great. Hi, Anthony Bull, Senior Web Dev at uh, Shop at Toomey. Um, Jess, you alluded to how uh, data-driven decisions are built into your product process. Margaret, you uh, dropped Swerve as a, as a tool that you're using. Tracy, you mentioned A-B testing, uh, but uh, you also talked about intuition. So I'm curious if I could uh, get, uh, get some information from you about your process in managing the priorities and the features that you think on the one hand are going to be great, but then you need to also have data behind the decisions that are going into which features you're going to roll out to 5, 10, X percent of your user base. So um, certainly uh, we as a company of 17 people uh, do not have a dearth of ideas of things we'd love to do, but uh, with a limited number of resources of engineering, uh, it's tough to tackle all of those. So if any of you have uh, something that you're passionate about, you'd love to share with the community about how you manage um, uh, the product to engineering, uh, and making sure you get in the features that uh, you think are gonna be game changers for your respective entities. I can start. I, have, I actually have a very timely example because we, we're in the middle of this A-B test right now and it's a new task form that we've been testing. And we wanted to really simplify the user experience and we kept hearing from users as they'd come in every week that, oh, it's, it's too hard to post a task and there's too many questions and so we really tried to make it simple and we came up with this gorgeous design. It's just really, really pleasing and completely different from our current task form. And we rolled it out in three categories, shopping, delivery, um, and other, just sort of a catch-all. And we A-B tested it in those categories. And so we've been running the test now. Uh, we thought we'd run it for a couple weeks and we'd get enough data to make a call which way we wanted to go. We've been running it for like six weeks now. And I just talked to Seema, who's our director of product, and she's like, I have some sad news for you. And I was like, oh my God, what happened, you know? And she's like, the simple shopping form, the simple test, it's failing. It, it, it's, it's just not working. And it, it was such a struggle because myself, the team, everyone wanted it to work so badly. And you have to live and die by the data. It doesn't work. And so it's sad that, you know, we ran the test and we had the one, the, the A test that we wanted to work, but it just doesn't. And so now it's time to just kind of cut our losses and move on. So I, I would say live and die by the data, but also you know have that qualitative research going um, on an ongoing basis that you can get feedback with. Thank you very much. Great, thanks. Hi, I'm Dan. Uh, you've talked a bit about how the seed community seems to determine how the community ends up ultimately turning out, and I was kind of curious if you think that's how it's always going to be? Like I remember reading a few weeks ago about Reddit, they initially seeded Reddit with a bunch of articles that they wanted to see the community kind of support. And so 
is this something that you can eventually move away from, or does your initial seed really determine kind of the entire lifespan of your community? It doesn't have to determine the entire lifespan. I think you have to start somewhere, um, and if you can do well there, then you can start figuring out what are the adjacent areas to move into um, and grow from there. I'm sure when Wikipedia started, it was not a comprehensive collection of articles about all topics ever, um, but they started off where they were strong and could move into different areas. Um, I saw this at Quora, where Quora started off with lots of questions about startups and tech and Silicon Valley. Um, they ran some analysis a couple months ago, and they were just looking at um, most upvoted answers in different topics, and there was now six very strong topic areas. So one of them was still startups and tech, but there was also food, there was also screenwriting and, and Hollywood, um, there was politics, and so you can be strategic about branching out into different areas. Um, and we've been seeing um, the same thing for Pinterest, where you know we started off with a with more, more women, and there's a certain demographic that we're in um, within the US, but we're starting to expand internationally, and the gender split there is much more even um, in the places we've rolled out to in the Spanish-speaking countries. Thank you. Thanks. So last question, some parting thoughts. We've talked a lot about how we've all been influenced by mentors, by the community. What is the most valuable piece of feedback that you've received as an entrepreneur that you'd like to pass on, and what's next for you? What's top of mind for you right now? Uh, I would say I would say um, the most valuable experience I've had as an entrepreneur. I feel I feel fortunate in some ways because I've I've had such great experiences working in tech and media and gaming. Point to an earlier question. I do, I we do um, design our products with um, gender, but also racial diversity in mind. I was just in Singapore a few weeks ago, and the exploding game community coming out of Indonesia was shocking. Um, but the, the, thing I, um, the thing I'm focusing on now is the shadow government, our game shadow government, perpetuating it in as many markets as we can. And the be best piece of advice I've ever received is accept failure swiftly and gracefully. Don't wallow on it. Move on. People might try to drag you back down in, not even intentionally, but be like, oh, don't even accept it. Just pick yourself up and move on and keep going. Um, I have, I think there's two, two things. One is, um, it's, and it's almost the philosophy of our company, it's do a few things well. Um, especially in the early days, it might be tempting to build out the, you know, your prototype with every bell and whistle that you've ever thought of, but really think about what that core most important thing is and just be exceptional at that one thing first, then add that second thing. Um, because otherwise, you're gonna, it's, it's, um, it, it's also difficult just to anal analyze your results. Um, so do a few things well, and I think that applies to all parts of your, your company. Um, and the other piece is uh, very similar, uh, is basically just don't don't give up. <laughs> um, people, it's easy to look at the companies that you read about in TechCrunch and think like, wow, everyone is doing so amazingly. But what you don't see is sort of like the blood, sweat, and tears underneath. And you also don't read about all the companies that are struggling, right? Like for every one company in TechCrunch that's like seems to be an overnight success, there's like 99,000 <laughs> others that are um, still still working at it. And the, you may think that oh, I'm you know I'm so far, I'm not like. I'm not, you know, that company, but just keep going. <laughs> there's, uh, there's, there's plenty, there's, it's, it's common to make mistakes. It's common to hire the wrong people. All the great companies have made all the same mistakes that you're probably making, so, um, yeah. <laughs> um, one advice I, I would be able to give you guys all is um, don't marry yourself to one idea. You have an overall vision, but your products may change, your, or it may merge and grow. Um, so just focusing on one thing that you thought first, um, you might get lost and your user base might move on if they don't see a growth. Uh, the best piece of advice I ever got was from uh, one of my mentors, Scott Griffith, who's the CEO of Zipcar. And he said to me, this is what got me to leave IBM. He said, Leah, I love your idea. I think you're on to something. I think you should see how far you can take it. And he kept saying to me, see how far you can take it. And so that's what I continue to do on a daily basis. And I think if you can not get overwhelmed, maybe, um, by, by this sort of big <coughs> picture and all the stuff that you need to do, but just think about pushing it forward every single day, um, that eventually you'll you know, have a company and, and it'll be sort of snowballing away. Um. My, my one thing is um, to always be 
improving. So just continually be improving yourself and your company and your product. Um, and that, that's about it. If you're always improving, you're in pretty good shape. Well, you're all remarkably talented, and we really appreciate you taking the time to share your insights with us. Have a wonderful rest of the Google I.O. day, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.